Uh, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the Adventures in History Land YouTube channel. Today, I am joined by Rene Chantran, all the way from Canada. Hello, Rene. Hey. Rene um, should be quite familiar to a lot of the people who watch this channel. Not maybe in visual form, but because of the towering amount of books that he has written uh, during his career. Um, some, some of which I own. Um, how many books would you think you've written by now, Rene? Well, there a lot of them are more like monographs, but uh, on the whole, I suppose we're looking at around 50 publications or so. Nice. I've never counted them because uh, <laughs> I, uh, I really get passionate when I do the research and write the book. And once it's gone, it's like gone. Mm -hmm. uh, I just look for, you know, either a continuation or another subject. And uh, then I'm all into that, but uh, I'm sort of amazed at uh, the, the this sort of way of looking at things. But on the other hand, gets things done. Mm -hmm. I know the feeling. I know the feeling well. Um, yeah. Just before we get kicking off into this, I, I need to, to do a couple of things that are required of me because I'm on YouTube. First of all, uh, thank you everybody for following this channel. I'm surprised a lot of you have put up with me uh, up till now. But if you want to continue, please share around that we're doing this. And uh, please, if you're just watching, like and subscribe if you like it. I mean, why wouldn't you like it? Rene Chartrand is here. I mean, he's a nice guy. Like, like and subscribe to this channel for Rene, okay? Um, don't make him sad. <laughs> and he'll come back as well if, if we do oh, this. Oh, sure. <laughs> uh, likewise, I need to very, very quickly also plug, because YouTube and it's a pain. Um, the uh, Armchair History TV, where some exclusive content videos I make especially for them are going up, do please uh, go over there and have a look. And if you like it, subscribe to them. Now, all of that rot out of the way, because, you know, this is supposed to be an ad free thing and they're forcing us all now to plug our own stuff. We return to Rene Chartrand. Now, I particularly like your books, Rene, because uh, although, the, I mean, the span of the subjects you have covered are, is quite impressive. I'm, my favorites must be the ones where you, you talk about the, the French army. And you're recently, I believe you're at the second, doing some very interesting work about the armies of Louis the Fourteenth. Yes. Uh, well, uh, it's uh, if you want me to elaborate a little bit on that, it seemed to be in English, or at least in English uh, language books, anyway, uh, an overview of the period with a lot of detail. Uh, that was uh, more or less a virgin territory because uh, not a great many people compared to the Napoleonic area, for instance, which I've also worked in at one point, uh, they, it's, uh, it's, it's a lot less covered than as far as I'm concerned, it's just as exciting. Um, the, uh, you get basically the same and well, the same in, in a way, a very different uh, aspect, but I think in a way, the French army, as we knew it in the Napoleonic area and this type of thing really started because of Louis XIV. The, to me, the sort of undiscovered statesman in all this, mm -hmm. we seem to know him a lot for some of the bad things he did, uh, such as, uh, you know, not liking, uh, reformed uh, people in religion and uh, all this sort of thing but uh, and that's unfortunately been uh, thrown a lot at him and i always wonder just as an aside why people don't uh, uh, in france don't seem to have too much of a memory about napoleon uh, abolish uh, re reinstating the slave trade in 1802, you know, for mm. instance, and yet, you know, he's a grand hero. Um, <laughs> Whereas, uh, but uh, yeah, I was, know, I was talking with a historian of the French Navy uh, some months ago, and he he had this sort of thing about he he explained it something like uh, people people are a little blind about Napoleon's faults because he's practically the only pe guy that they get taught about <laughs> or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, in the 
in the Louis XIV things, uh, I uh, made the equation in volume three of my uh, four volume, and that's it, folks. <laughs> <laughs> At least in Europe. After I, after that, I'm moving to the West Indies. Uh, the uh, uh, yes, the soldiers and buccaneers of the Sun King. And that's I, I like the sound of that. <laughs> Oh, actually, uh, thank you. <laughs> uh, the Hellion liked it too, and uh, the uh, so I'm proceeding, but I, it'll be sometime mm -hmm. next year when it appears. And no, uh, I linked it with what happened in Ireland at the same time. And, uh, you know, that's another rather forgotten or things that you'd like to keep in the closet in England. Uh, but uh, there it is. <laughs> <laughs> I probably have an advantage as an historian. Yeah. Not because uh, I'm particularly good, a good historian. I'm just uh, one that I suppose reads documents, but likes to go to the archives. Mm -hmm. And um, But um, I'm neither British yeah. nor French. Mm -hmm. I'm a French Canadian with actually what you see, about half of it is from the United Kingdom and Belgium. Because my ancestors, you know, it's all mixed. So we I have objectivity from, in everything. Excellent. I, 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 well, I come from a trading family in Montreal. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, the, Montreal's a meeting place, just like London. It's true. It's <laughs> melting, 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 plot, melting pot oh, of, melting <laughs> of everything. Uh, but, it, yeah, I, I think I, I agree about Louis XIV. I mean, just as a case in point, my acquaintance with Louis XIV comes through books about the Duke of Marlborough. And oh. as a result, you don't get a very good picture of the guy. You know, he's the tyrant that Britain has to fight off. You know, it's part of the legacy that of, uh, it's that big chunk of British historiography that had to paint. Every, they had to have the national nemesis and it was usually French up until a certain point. And uh, as a result, I think that probably kind of is quite a bit of why people think the way they do about Louis XIV. Well, there's a uh, pros and cons as always. I don't think people are going to like my, well, like, uh, they're good. I think people are going to be surprised at volume four when it appears, because mm -hmm. that's the Marlboro area. Ah, yes. <laughs> my books are always in two parts, as you know, in this series. It's, there's, there's a narrative, then there's a... <clears throat> A small chapter on the economy, and then we get on with the material culture, the guns, the uniforms, mm -hmm. and then this volume for the uh, military architecture, too. Uh, I was, after all, a curator at the National Historic Sites of Canada, so uh, I do know a bit about that, too. <laughs> yeah, and, and who doesn't like to talk about uh, Vauban? architecture well uh, <laughs> he's, he's, uh, in the list of great marshals uh, I, I can add Vauban but that is what yeah we'll, we will be talking about the marshals today and some of the uh, as many as we can I would think uh, I actually had someone asking me uh, not too long ago to, to talk about Almanza and stuff like that um, but to begin with I wanted to ask um, about the army itself that Louis the uh, 14th inherited when he came to the throne and because if you're going to discuss his sort of his the wars of Louis the Fourteenth, I think it's helpful to know what was the raw materials that he had to to work with. The short answer, uh, if there can be one, is in his uh, uh, memoirs, which actually memos to his then infant son, the Dauphin, as to uh, go governance. And it's a memoir in the sense also, he says, when he took power, came to the throne in 1661, uh, he was king since 1643, but once, uh, as you know, Cardinal Mazarin, the prime minister uh, left, well, then he became the king uh, in, in, as, an, uh, uh, as an autocrat. Uh, and uh, he, he, stayed, he said, I saw, there was disorder everywhere. I mean, it was disorder in the army. There was probably no navy. Uh, uh, governors of provinces uh, were pretty well doing their thing. The army was a strange collection of uh, units and officers 
that were not named by the king. They were named by the captain uh, general of infantry. And mm -hmm. so he was getting you can see you know, problems there <laughs> table, uh, and all the rest of it. So um, uh, the, one of the first things uh, he did was saying uh, he had the first council meeting, you know, uh, with the royal treasurer, and there was a cardinal there for religious affairs and so on, and and several letters, uh, secretary of war and so on. And he said, "Well, I'm the prime minister now. I, I'm assuming that post." And to the Secretary of War, he says, and for it, there's no more, um, I'm taking control of the army also. And, uh, and uh, to the, uh, and for it, uh, we're looking at the financial affairs of the, uh, of the country. And uh, he'd been already warned that uh, there were some very strange things going on. And I mentioned that in volume one, when uh, Fouquet, the then uh, Minister of Finance, uh, is found to line his pockets and build a beautiful castle, invites the king to show him, and the king's not very happy. Uh, maybe he got his ideas to build Versailles there, but at the time, <laughs> you're, you're not supposed to do this. So, uh, you know, he was found uh, guilty, and actually, he actually was by Colbert, who succeeded him and uh, became actually one of the great ministers of uh, France uh, all around. Mm -hmm. So he had a good eye to um, surround himself with competent people. In, in the army, uh, the first thing uh, he did was to have... Uh, continue if you like but especially uh, have the uh, a very good minister of war as well and uh, that uh, that certainly created things and these guys were thinking like him they wanted to uh, have a, a system that works mm -hmm. the army before uh, was not a bad army the french army of uh, before 1661 Mm -hmm. I, well, they, and, they beat this. They beat the Spanish at Roqua. Well, so. exactly, <laughs> and that was, uh, and again, a lucky thing for Louis XIV because, um, uh, well, it was more than luck. But when well, you think yeah, of, Conde was involved, so yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, but Conde was only twenty-two, so uh, you know he was he he, he more, more or less revealed himself as a. Mm -hmm near genius <laughs> uh, and uh, much to Turin's, oh, we're talking about Marshall, but <laughs> yeah. uh, the, uh, why not? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and uh, they, uh, they, they had a okay army. It was uh, the point that Louis XIV had was, okay, this is army, this is all right, but it's not a very big army. Uh, at that time, we're looking at about, oh, 100,000 men, may more or less in various ways. And, but it's, it's, it's a big enough army, mm -hmm. but uh, for, the, for the time. But he wants something much bigger and he's gonna get it. Well, uh, because <laughs> he's made uh, a few uh, calculations, obviously. Uh, and now we're talking nationwide and Europe-wise. In France at that time is the most populated country in Europe by far. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I'd be very interested to know about how economics and everything ties into how he was able to create uh, the army, but also that is obviously the bedrock of how you fight wars. I mean, there's there's lots of classical quotes about you know if you if you want to basically win wars, have a lot of money is essentially the. <laughs> You, you need that, and how do you create money? Uh, yeah, there's Bitcoin today, but uh, mm -hmm. they didn't have that then. And as you uh, said, and, uh, uh, Louis came to the throne and there was chaos everywhere. So yeah. the transformation from the point he takes over to, say, even the, the, six, the, turn, of the turn of the 18th century is, is really quite remarkable, really. Yeah. Is, or is it? Uh, <laughs> or is it? Well, I, uh, of course, I argue it is. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, I, but I'll, but it's because the Sun King is there to play play the game, and he plays it pretty well. And he's got a he has a European and even a world view. 
uh, there's ambitions, but uh, he's very persistent with these things. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think I remember embassies to Siam and all sorts of things in his oh, time. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Well, I'll be. Uh, I might be dealing with that in a yet another book <laughs> uh, in, in 2023, uh, because uh, the, the publishers like me, you know, and uh, so. Uh, Stay tuned, uh, everyone. Be, be, being retired and nothing to do, you know. <laughs> it's a golden moment for you, Rene. But uh, how does how does how does the fr France's sort of what sounds like a very impressive economy? Uh, it is uh, well. It. It's, not, it's an economy of twenty-two million, or twenty to twenty-two million, or eighteen. I mean, you know, statistics in those days are just as bad as today, and uh, the. Um, Compared to that, Great Britain is about seven or eight million uh, people. Uh, Spain's about six. Austria is about eight. I, I've got my notes. <laughs> Russia, though, uh, is about ten. Uh, the uh, but Russia is far, mm -hmm. and so we come into what I call the Ottoman equation. Um, what other big power is there in Europe, uh, but not Western Europe? Uh, if you take Germany, um, which is Austria also then, that's 300 states mm -hmm. in that time. So, uh, they, yes, they have population. No, the union makes force. No, it doesn't work. Um, so, now France also, at that time, in the, uh, supposedly an agricultural uh, country, of, uh, and it is, uh it's the these people still call, call it the garden of europe it's the most lush place in western europe you go to spain it's not quite the same i mean yeah. i've been to spain so many times uh not, mostly researching there in spain and portugal the closest probably is north and italy i was going to say italy must be perhaps the only other place that could rival northern italy yeah yeah because southern Italy is essentially out of Rome, it starts to get dry. Yeah, uh, and uh, then Germany is well. Uh, the geography is in it for something, and also the political unity is not there. Mm -hmm. uh, a place like Bavaria, uh, Munich, and all that, very prosperous. But then that too is a garden. But mm -hmm. not everywhere in Germany is a garden. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, and the political uh, unity. So, uh, Louis XIV looks at this and says, okay, I'm, uh, I'm the biggest country in Western Europe. And if we, uh, the, the, the next biggest neighbor, which we have to deal with is of course, all the other countries, but also the Ottoman Turks. If we can find an equation to sort of keep relations more or less going and war to, go to war at the same time and this uh, and maybe have the same enemies um, that could work it that didn't really work and the ottomans finally got beaten up by uh, the austrians uh, and the venetians and all that but uh, they were in a decline of power like spain was uh, the battle of rocroa wiped out Spain as Europe's premier uh, power. And, you know, no matter how much gold they got to, from the Indies, <laughs> the weight of population and a good economy uh, was, uh, you know, mm -hmm. creating havoc in, in Spain. Mm -hmm. uh, in France, um, on the contrary, Col someone like Colbert really reorganizes the economy. But there's one big caveat to that, that the French tax system was absolutely horrible. Mm -hmm. uh, a bit uh, like in the United States now. And uh, the, uh, the very rich are very rich. Um, then yeah. there's things like the church that owns a quarter to a third of the land mm -hmm. uh, and so on and so on. But nevertheless, there's capital there. Uh, the key to that is um, French capital uh, during this whole period is over 90% raised in France. In other countries, it's much less. Mm -hmm. 
and it's an economic rule. Uh, I've studied economic finance, uh, unfortunately, uh, so that's how this gets into the books. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm not an expert on well, that. It, I mean, it should never be overlooked, this sort of thing, no. to the success of a country, especially at this time. Well, we're creating a war, an economy that can perform well in war. Mm -hmm. uh, so how do you do? Uh, in those days, money is very stable. Uh, if you get a, uh, you know, a shilling a day, a century later, you'll be, that shilling will be still worth about the same thing. Mm -hmm. So in one of the books, I think it was the second one, I sort of explained, okay, uh, if you want to really rise that, what do you do? Well, one of the things you do is to create demand and things like that, is have a war. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> uh, that's a very good point. If you have a war, then the, uh, you create a lot of demand. Uh, there's money in France. Uh, a lot of it is secreted. Um, the, uh, the Bill Gates or the great financier of the day is, uh, is, is a Frenchman. And in fact, um, during the worst of the war of, of Spanish succession, the, uh, during the mid uh, early 1700s, um, they have a meeting and he provides uh, new credit and uh, everything else from his, uh, and remember this comes in France. So sure, the national debt goes up, but uh, what's happening in Britain at the same time, and it's one of the explanations that I give to as to why did Britain leave that war earlier than the Austrians and its allies, it's just walked out which I think was a little, uh, you know, uh, they, they drave, the Brits uh, draped themselves in the glory of Marlborough with all this, mm -hmm. but they seem to forget that Marlborough's soldiers had to be evacuated in 1711, <laughs> which is beautifully described uh, in, in Fortescue's history. That, uh, he shows the soldiers themselves were just torn yeah. at this. You know, how can we... Uh, they're saying goodbye to their auxiliaries and allies in Flanders. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, after a, a change uh, in Parliament, had uh, confirmed the fears of Queen Anne, uh, which she was getting, that uh, the British debt was getting out of Anne. I mean, it's, it's true. Uh, as well, if you just just in simplistic terms, I mean, the war had been going on for about ten years, and yeah. there was no great end in sight without a heavy, heavy amount of losses, and yet more expenditure. And the objective was ostensibly to prevent a Bourbon union across Spain and France. And it right, and by 1711, uh, everybody's agrees that the victories of Marlborough and Prince Eugene and Flanders were, and Bavaria were wonderful. Glen Eyne and everything else, great battlefield stuff. But at one point you've got to leave the battlefield mm -hmm. and see what's going on elsewhere. There are other battlefields. And by 1711, Berwick and Vendome have secured Spain. Uh, the only place that uh, is uh, still uh, in doubt is Catalonia with Barcelona. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, British industry is not what it was, would be a century later. Uh, you know, the biggest producer of steel and, uh, and, and iron in, in Europe at the time? It's France. Uh, I actually found it in the Cambridge uh, economic history. So, uh, you know, I, uh, I salute uh, the uh, English oh. academics who kindly provided this. Mm -hmm. But uh, the uh, it, it's one of those things. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so France essentially had by that point, and this is the last of Louis' great wars, isn't it? Yeah. Um, had essentially built itself to a state where it could outlast, even in a war that was militarily, as we were saying, it wasn't a very, terribly very successful difficult. war. <laughs> yeah. 
And they were, you know, it wasn't all rosy. There were climate issues in France, uh, which would hit the, uh, now you never hear the English and the Germans talking about this, except that when you research a little bit, yes, they were, they were hard hit too. Uh, you know, uh, even in the Mediterranean, uh, I found an account of a Royal Navy, not a big ship, but a ship, uh, the, the, the crew froze to death which you know uh it's not it, good <laughs> sort of thing. and uh you know in france it was pretty bad uh, the uh, especially in the agricultural parts and so on mm -hmm. uh, there were thousands of people starved and and uh, died of frost mm -hmm. but it happened in england too uh, mm -hmm. there's a couple of accounts of that so um but economically uh, the wealth of the nation was basically created inside, both in uh, production terms and in financial terms. Mm -hmm. in, and that uh, obviously allows you to fight wars abroad. And as we think well, about, uh, if you um, take if you take uh, most of your foreign uh, your debt, national debt becomes foreign or foreign mm -hmm. voted, and of course we see this in uh, third world countries no matter how much, how good they are at agriculture or whatever uh, or whatever else they do if they don't control that that's it it's mm -hmm. a form of colonialism yeah absolutely uh, uh, and uh, even though uh, uh france would decline thereafter after louis the 14th though that would you know yeah uh, well france declined in uh I'd say it's governance, it's yeah. vision yeah. after Louis XIV. Yeah. Uh, with Louis XV, um, it's really different. I don't have, mm -hmm. have too much time for him. Well, yes, exactly. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, accident I'm accidentally taking you down a bad road here. Because... It, it's, you know... Let's... <laughs> because Louis XIV, his army was quite good, actually. But it's a whole different episode. We don't have time for it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, the army... Okay, back to the army yeah. uh, which Fortini created. Yes, it was quite good. And guess what? Everybody copied it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, from introducing uniforms to uh, mm -hmm. having weapons of the same caliber, you know, just the, yeah. the, the, this the, another, so logical today. Yeah. But it's not then. No, it's, it's, a, it's, it's another one of the improvements on the, you know, in quotes, military revolution started by Maurice of Nassau, which yeah. was about standardization and simplification of yes. armed forces and obviously and regulation of them regulation and with louis XIV, we take another step we end up with an army uh, so big that it it hasn't been seen since the roman empire mm. now how do you feed all these people you know whether they need uh, every man gets a piece of bread a day and i uh, yes and a, a coherent um uh, system is created and i've seen plans of things like the bakeries which they build in areas which and they're absolutely you know it, it's worthy of uh, you know any uh, modern bakery for supermarkets here <laughs> uh, the uh, it's it's just amazing mm -hmm. but um, and that's just that so of course all the other armies that want to get big and good like the French army, uh, they end up doing all the same things. They create, they too create grenadiers. They too eventually get uh, uh, the Royal Guard. This is a before. very good segue. This is a very good segue. One of the things that Louis XIV did yeah. was create a Royal Guard. And oh, he didn't create it. Yes, indeed. it was there. It, yes, uh, of course, it was. Uh, it, Louis the Thirteenth had one and stuff like that. What he did, he he did, he did, he did, um, he did what the Sun King does, and he massively expanded it. And I, you know, you can come and hate me if you want, viewers, but as far as I'm concerned, Louis the Fourteenth's Royal Guard could send Napoleon's Royal Guard packing any day of the week. <laughs> Well, uh, the uh, we left to think about uh, yes, uh, probably so. Uh, they were certainly uh, out there when they needed to be, and sometimes they didn't. They were they were little glitches, but on the roll. But the the idea 
uh, that Louis XIV brought in, I think, in this, and it's sort of uh, unheralded, really. Uh, it's before that a royal guard, an imperial guard, or uh, you know, uh, before the Romans and all the rest of it, uh, was really a guard. Mm -hmm. uh, it was to guard the sovereign uh, and have a comfortable number of uh, guardsmen and perhaps a, an infantry regiment and everything else for the royal palace and everything else and or the castle or you name it uh, but what he what he created uh, was have a royal guard division and really almost an army corps that would be elite mm -hmm. and he could uh, build on that because obviously france was amongst the first to reintroduce this concept and the yeah. early 1600s to have like so, a bat, take the guard with you on, yeah, on campaign. Yeah. So, so you look at the organization and you, you've got a number of uh, uh, dedicated palace guards uh, and then you've got the royal guard uh, which some of it's not, not in Versailles mm -hmm. uh, like the, the king's musketeers they're actually in Paris my favorite guard regiment uh, René's written a very good book about that. I recommend you get that. <laughs> oh, that was thank you. That was uh, that, uh, that was uh, that was fun. Then um, what he did also, they, the, the nobles are always wanting commissions and everything else. Uh, and there's a lot of nobles in France, and uh, they uh, they all want commissions in the army. Uh, there's too many of them, but at least they should be educated because Louis the Fourteenth set rules that henceforth, if you want a commission, you'd better go to school. Um, and the King's Musketeers were also the, the ancestor of the Military Academy. Mm -hmm. One of uh, the first in Europe, I think, the Musketeer yeah, Academy. Yeah, because it was uh, the thing to do to be a cadet in uh, the Royal Guard, uh, you know, long before that. But uh, to organize it this way, again, order, you know, mm -hmm. you like Absolutely. order. So uh, how, does, how does Louis make the royal guards as a battlefield tool as a tool of war work for him essentially why, what is the benefit of taking this corps into the field well the benefit uh, is that belonging to the guard becomes very very prestigious it was before but now it's prestigious in many ways uh, either by your battle experience uh, and so on but also you're better paid uh, somebody who has served in the guard and I'm taking a Canadian example here. Uh, one, uh, the first uh, Governor General Vaudreuil, not the second one. He he'd been in a, a young uh, officer in the guard, uh, in the Musketeers, as a matter of fact, and he became Governor General of North America, mm -hmm. French North America, which was a big job. Yeah. Uh, and uh, he, died, he died in Quebec City, but. Um, He's not the only one by far. A lot of well, the others. The list is ridiculous of, of musketeers and people who, you know, yeah. they started in the garden and ended up somewhere else. Yeah, uh, well, a lot of them did. And uh, some, uh, some of them didn't, but uh, they, they were certainly uh, also expected to be uh, loyal to the king, needless to say. The, poli the, the political activities were down to a minimum. The, mm -hmm. uh, the uh, Henry and these people, which were the, the secret police, uh, we were always watching out for this stuff. And usually it's the musketeers yeah. who, uh, who became the secret police. They fascinate me, the musketeers, because they're, they're, in, they're insane. And they're so, <laughs> like so, some of the most useful people you can have around you. They're, they're some of the deadliest people you'll meet on a street. And they capture fortresses by themselves practically it's it's insane <laughs> well they're certainly the leading element in some of uh, the fortresses yeah exactly uh, at, I... at some point you cannot have a forlorn hope that does not include the musketeers it's just not done <laughs> uh, i remember some forlorn hopes breaking down somehow uh 
uh, some play, some part of the wall in this Dutch city, which was supposed to be impregnable. And the next thing you know, they hi, <laughs> <laughs> you know, hey, we're here. Yeah, <laughs> and, you, uh, you won't be able to get us out either. <laughs> oh, no, but, uh, there you go. Just come in. Uh, we, we've cleared the way. Um, it didn't always work this way, uh, and sometimes they got really mauled. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and also the uh, with the guard, there was a. a with the guard guard, there was another, which I deal with in volume three, which is neither line and not quite guard. It's the Gendarmerie de France. Oh, yes. And that's 10 companies or 12, 14, I think at one point of, uh, so it's not an enormous core, but then if you add that, you've got more than a division, then you've got almost uh, a small army corps. Mm -hmm. And when, you know, they're out there, uh, when the war is declared, you know, what happens? Uh, uh, there's not a lot of people left in Versailles. They're out in Flanders or they're out in Italy or somewhere or in Spain, uh, whatever. Um, in sp another thing, uh, which brings me back to Spain, it, to me, that was the object of the war. Of this, yeah, this, it's called it the War of the Spanish Succession. Is called the yeah. War of Spanish it, Succession. It's it, it certainly uh, a reason, yeah. The, and its conclusion, uh, well, uh, you know, the uh, Spain was restored, and Spain was starting to go through a um, uh, a rebirth mm -hmm. at that point, and this this will continue in the 18th century. And then, you know, uh, until the Napoleonic War where mm -hmm. it, uh, it collapses. But. Yeah, there, there was sort of a, a decline in Spain, sort of during this, I guess, I guess 17, the 16th, yeah, the 17th, yeah. It's the whole 17th century that's just a It's just a, a decline, mess. yeah. And then, yeah. and then the, and then the War of the Spanish Succession happens and until about 17, 90 i guess to be honest yeah. um yeah. they're actually on the up again up and up again yeah. especially yeah. with carlos the third and things like that well, of course i'll uh, i'll put in that it's because of louis the 14th and uh, it's hard to argue with it because it's his it's his line it's <laughs> it's his well, line that sort of coincides with the change <laughs> well once they got uh philip the fifth as the candidate uh they proceeded uh, a whole bunch of French uh, officers, and not only officers, but very good bureaucrats, uh, proceeded to train and said, look, we've got to reorganize the government. And most of the Spanish grandees said, yeah, we'd better do something. Yeah. Uh, and um, uh, as a result, uh, not so much at Almanza, although it's pretty good there, but by the time they get to Bruguela, and Villa Chiosa in 1710, 1711, and they just wipe out uh, whatever mm -hmm. British, Austrian, and Dutch that's there. Uh, mm -hmm. And also uh, the Austrian candidate to the uh, Spanish throne. There's not a lot of Spaniards that want him. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. uh, even at, uh, uh, thanks to curator, uh, Hodson there at the Royal Collection, uh, she she kindly, Yolande, she kindly uh, uh, shared with me a document they had which showed that there were only four units of uh, Spaniards uh, with uh, Sternberg's army and uh, the rest of them were, were uh, of course, uh, British, uh, Portuguese, uh, being allied with the Portuguese uh, did not uh, was not a popularity contest with most of the uh, yeah, uh, and, and the, they, the Portuguese and the uh, no. and the Spanish <laughs> just uh, as I put it, and I've worked with historians of both countries, and I really truly appreciate both places, and I also remember that. As a French uh, journalist, Michel Deon once put it, Portugal, uh, Portuguese and the Spaniard are not so much face to face, but back to back <laughs> <laughs> on their borders. Yeah. And that, yeah. that's it all. And I've quoted that. Mm -hmm. But um, 
the, 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 entire we're... War, the entire war right. itself uh, the, the 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 side in spain who supported the bourbons were could legitimately say we are doing the will of the king you know right. our spanish king put this in his will that the the uh, the son of the dauphin should be king of spain so they had a very a very strong sort of uh, political yeah, position they did and um, i'd say too that the austrian um, dutch uh, starnberg particular occupation troops as it were they took madrid and well the short time they stayed it was pretty well disastrous mm -hmm. because madrid was very happy with them and of course they came out with uh, uh the typical bad dying uh, type of uh, le legal looting really and uh, so naturally when uh, Philip V came back with the Spanish French army because there was a French army large French army corps with them now Louis XIV was supporting that war as well mm -hmm. financially and with uh, with men mm -hmm. and I mean you know a lot of men 40,000 or so uh, and as we've seen, he could afford to do it. He had men everywhere. <laughs> yeah. This was always uh, what I was uh, questioning when I was looking at a lot of history and saying, well, how come you, they're always broke and they can <laughs> deploy everywhere and, you know, uh, sure, we lose some battle disastrously. The next year they're back. Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, the, this sort of thing. And there was a story I remember oh, the French can't even get shoes uh, because they now they have wooden shoes. Uh, if you know your material culture a little bit, even in Canada, we had wooden shoes. You wear those in the, uh, during the wet season. Mm -hmm. A lot better than a pair of leather shoes. Yeah. And so, so that's what they did. They'd give them. Uh, these uh, these type of shoes in the winter and then of course they got they made the other ones last so simple well and